Right. Good morning, everybody. Let's get started. Thanks for joining us. Welcome to the latest uh, TBI Talks webinar this morning. Uh, my name's Ian Mulhern. I'm the Executive Director for UK Policy here at the Institute. And today we have uh, an hour's session focusing on the question, is the unemployment crisis fracturing the climate consensus? Um, and uh, so we're really going to be focusing for the next hour or so on the politics of the climate change uh, challenge uh, as much as the policy of it. Uh, uh, the 2020s, as we all know, is a key decade for us to make progress uh, on the net zero agenda. Um, and it requires a sustained political uh, consensus. And certainly at the start of 2020, uh, we were seeing in, from polling data record levels of public support for uh, action on climate change. Uh, but then, of course, we got hit with the, co the COVID-19 crisis, uh, and that's set to cause a big jump in the level of unemployment, which will be a challenge that we're going to be dealing with um, for some months and perhaps years uh, to come. And we know that in the past, over, for example, the, the financial crisis, uh, the levels of support for uh, action on the environment took a dip when economic pressures became uh, more uh, pressing. So really today, one of the key things we want to talk about is what can we do to shore up that consensus? What does this mean for uh, policy? How should policy uh, adapt in the face of the political pressures and the political priorities shifting as radically and as rapidly as they have in the wake of COVID-19? Um, we're also meeting, obviously, in the context of uh, less than a year ago now, the 2019 election, which saw some significant political realignments and changes uh, that potentially have uh, an impact on support for a uh, political um, consensus behind the uh, action on climate change. And of course, we have just over one year to go until the UK hosts the COP26 uh, uh, conference, uh, a critical moment for the UK to show action and leadership. Uh, in this space. So it's a uh, it's a critical moment to be considering the politics of climate change and what we can uh, do to uh, uh, foster uh, action in this space. And to talk about it this morning, I have three absolutely brilliant speakers uh, to hear from. We'll first hear from uh, Professor Rebecca Willis. Uh, uh, Professor Willis is uh, focuses on climate, energy, uh, uh, policy and politics at the University of Lancaster. Um, uh, uh, Rebecca is the expert lead also for the Climate Assembly uh, UK, which we'll hear a fair amount about, I'm sure, since it speaks very directly to the heart of this question about the policies of climate change. And she's also the author of the, uh, of the book that came out uh, just as we went into lockdown called Too Hot to Handle, uh, The Democratic Challenge of Climate Change. Uh, then we'll go to hear from Mary Cray. Uh, Mary is the CEO of Living Streets. Uh, and she was until the last election, the MP, the Labour MP for Wakefield, uh, one of those seats that turned over to the Conservatives in the election. Uh, and Mary uh, may be familiar to many of you as the, the chair of the Environmental Audit Committee for a number of years as well. Uh, and then we'll uh, move over to hear from Claire O'Neill. Claire is the MD of Climate and Energy at the World Business Council for Sustainable Development. She's also the former Minister for Energy and Clean Growth. Uh, and was the COP26 president delegate so designate. So we'll uh, no doubt have a lot to say on uh, those questions and where the government's agenda is uh, is going uh, in, in uh, the run up to that important event. Um, we will hear from our speakers for about five minutes, five or six minutes each. I think Mary has some slides as well. Uh, and uh, as we go, please feel free to put your questions uh, for speakers in the Q&A box, type them in. Uh, and then when we get to the Q&A section, I will come to various people, uh, hopefully trying to group uh, uh, themes of questions and unmute you to ask your questions. So uh, hopefully we can have a good uh, discussion at that point. Uh, but at that point, I will hand over Rebecca to you to kick us off. Thank you very much, Ian. It's, it's really good to be here. So I thought, given that, that neither academics nor politicians are known for straight answers to questions, I'm going to directly answer your question, is the unemployment crisis fracturing, fracturing the climate consensus? Um, I don't think it is yet, but I have real worries that it could do. Um, 
I think if we're going to avoid this, the, the, the thing that we really need to focus on is creating a climate strategy which is sensitive to the needs and aspirations of local areas and local communities. And, um, and obviously linked to that one which politicians feel that they can own. Um, so my, my reasoning for this is that um, as few, a few years ago, as part of my university research, I set out to understand how um, MPs understand climate change. And I did a whole set of interviews from politici with politicians from all the different parties. Um, and the headline was that they absolutely understood the climate threat. They were worried about it, but they were really struggling to fit it into uh, political life. And that's partly because they were worried that if they spoke out on climate change, they would be seen as outsiders. And this was quite a strong finding, actually. Um, they were worried that if they became too much of a climate champion, they would be, and these are those, their words, not mine, they would be seen as a freak or a zealot. Um, and a linked concern that they had was that um, they were struggling to connect climate to the issues that they knew their constituents cared about. And, you know, as one said to me, you don't want to be talking about polar bears, you want to be talking about jobs. And they were actually underestimating the levels of, of public support for climate change. Um, they, they, they were actually sort of avoiding the issue. And it was this work and these findings which made me realise how important it was to get a better dialogue going between citizens and politicians on the climate crisis. And that's why um, I helped to bring about and then was delighted to be involved in Climate Assembly UK, which you mentioned in. So Climate Assembly is um, a citizens assembly um, established by Parliament. And the idea is that you bring together, in this case, 108 people who... Um, who are invited because they're perfectly representative of the UK as a whole in terms of geographical location, age, gender, um, socioeconomic background, ethnicity and so on. So it's basically the UK in miniature. And um, you, you, you give these people um, a, a, a lot of information, the time to learn about climate change and how we deal with it. The question was, how do we get to net zero? So you gave them time to learn, to discuss with experts and really crucially with each other, um, to deliberate and then to make recommendations about a strategy for net zero that would fit with their outlooks and aspirations. And I mean, I'd really suggest that you look at the uh, report. There's a huge amount of detail there. Um, but I'm just going to pick out a few things which speak to the to the question of, of, of jobs and employment. I mean, overall, the assembly findings gave a very strong mandate for, for, for climate action. People absolutely saw the need um, to get to net zero and for the UK to be seen to playing to be playing that role internationally. Um, and a key theme that emerged in terms of the principles that people wanted to see guiding that process was fairness, quite widely defined, but cr as crucial part of that definition of fairness was a fairness between regions and for people whose lives might change as a result of the transition to net zero. And that, of course, employ includes changes to employment. And I was part of the group that was discussing energy use in the home. And there was loads of talk about, you know, what would happen to gas fitters if you banned gas central heating. Lots of excitement, actually, about potential new jobs in zero carbon industries. And then uh, three quarters of the way through Climate Assembly, we'd done three weekends out of four. That's when COVID hit and we couldn't meet in person for our final weekend. So like the rest of the world, we took to Zoom. And one of the things that participants told us is that they really wanted to discuss those links between uh, COVID recovery, economic recovery from COVID and climate. And some of the strongest levels of consensus in the whole process actually were um, participants, you know, with sort of 80, 90 percent approval ratings were saying that um, COVID recovery plans should be linked directly to net zero. Um, so that, you know, if government was providing support for different in industries, it should, it should absolutely align that with its net zero ambitions. And that the opposite, where you just give out money um, in order to, uh, to try and stimulate the economy without regard to net zero, was seen as something that they wanted to avoid. Um, another really important principle to come out of the assembly was 
strong support for local areas uh, taking the lead. So essentially a kind of devolution of climate strategy. And, and, and I think that is another thing that is absolutely crucial to gaining consent. Um, people wanted um, local areas and local organisations to be in charge um, of the transition to net zero because they wanted strategies that were sensitive to the particularities of place. Um, so really the Climate Assembly I think is really helpful for this discussion because it gave a, a strong mandate to climate action but also some clear steers about what that should look like and actually something that's quite different from the way things have, have happened over the past decade or so. Um, so that's the upbeat stuff. I'm afraid I'm going to end on a downer, <laughs> which is what happens if you don't get this right, because I've seen this unfold in front of me. Um, I live just over the border from uh, Lancaster in, in Cumbria, and we've seen over the past year uh, local politicians voting three times to consent a coal mine. This is politicians from all three main parties. This coal mine, which would produce coal for steel, is responsible, would be responsible for 9 million tonnes of emissions a year. That's the same as Belfast, Edinburgh and Cardiff combined. And the one argument in favour of the mine is the promise, um, we're not sure how likely it is, but the promise of 500 jobs. And, um, you know, this situation came about because there had been no effort to look at what a stable and prosperous and zero carbon future could look like for that part of the world, which, you know, does desperately need inward investment. And um, as a result, councillors, the local councillors felt that they had to choose dirty jobs over no jobs. And that is not a choice we should be asking local politicians to make. So, I mean, I argue strongly that the coal mine shouldn't open, but I can understand why in the situation we're in, um, local politicians, not all but most, and um, a, a good portion of local people supported it. So we absolutely need a climate strategy that's alive to those sensitivities. And I think that's the way that we will uh, manage to, uh, to, 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 to get to zero carbon in a way that maintains the uh, cross party consensus that we've had on climate change and also the high levels of support that we've had historically for climate action. Thanks, Rebecca. That's great. And, and reading the some of the um, comments from the uh, Climate Assembly's um, work, um, it's, it's fascinating just how strong, as you say, the, con the consensus was even after the um, COVID crisis struck of just the, the kind of sense of uh, commitment to uh, a green recovery. Um, but there were also some comments in there that where people were sort of balancing the two and saying well we need to you know make sure that we're we're um tackling the, the economic uh, challenge as well um and i just wonder what did it give you a sense of what you would what you would say politicians should change about their approach uh to the to to, to the the next year or two um in in light of of covid did, did it give you a sense that you know we should be pushing this kind of agenda more than that or or did it not? Did you did you think the consensus is solid enough for us to essentially carry on with the agenda as it was? Well, I mean, I want to give you a sort of process answer and a substantive answer. The process answer is that you know what climate assembly shows is 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 what a rich seam of evidence and intelligence you can get if you actually ask people and um you know i'm sure that will be very familiar to, to 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 claire and mary it's actually an advantage of our constituency system that you know mps can feel that connection to to local areas and that hasn't been exploited enough in the policy making process actually so i'm as part of my research now i'm looking at much more fine-grained ways that we can build people's views and values into the policy making process as a matter of course as an alternative to this sort of actually quite sterile sort of six week consultation where you know the only people at pylon are the people that hang around the corridors of Westminster and Whitehall so there I think there is a process answer to that in terms of substance I think that it is um about giving much more ownership um, to local areas. And we've actually seen, I think, more success in the cities because they've managed to sort of 
muster the resources by joining forces across urban areas and you see much more proactive um, local climate strategies emerging in uh, Greater Manchester for example and also in, um, in, in areas like the Humber who've, where they've really prospered from green industries but especially in small cities, towns, areas like West Cumbria, you know your classic red wall areas actually, mm. we're not seeing that taken forward so I think that's the challenge now. Okay, great. That seems like a perfect timing to hand over, Mary, to you. Right, I'm going to share my screen um, and my slideshow. So um, thanks very much for inviting me here today. I just want to skip through a couple of slides um, and share some reflections about where we were even six months ago and where we are now. So this is where we were a few months ago. We had Greta in Parliament um, a year or maybe two years ago now. Um, we had Extinction Rebellion um, blocking the streets of London. And um, on the right, you have the global temperature change over the last 150 years. And what you can see is that the safe operating space in, in which we're operating um, has just got a lot more uh, confined and difficult. Um, we have had uh, a huge uh, economic health uh, and social shock with COVID. And in a way, I think it's, um, it's our last big dress rehearsal for the climate crisis. COVID has um, shown us the inequalities that exist in our societies. Um, it has highlighted those inequalities and it has worsened them. It threatens our physical health, it threatens uh, our economic health and it shows, uh, we have a gentleman here from the Forest of Dean who put this poster in his window, um, which was basically a plea for friendship. Um, and it's shown the epidemic of loneliness and isolation that we have across the country. And that lack of physical mobility, which comes from a car dependent society, that comes from streets that aren't fit for purpose, is also, I think, a threat to social mobility. Because if you're a young, unemployed person and you're in a pit village in Wakefield and there is no train and no bus service uh, or the bus goes twice a day, you're not going to get to college, you're not going to get on in life. And so that physical mobility threat is also a threat to people's social mobility. Um, I think I was trying to work out if there was any consolation to be had from COVID and it has been a pretty um, catastrophic uh, wake up call. It has revealed the lack of resilience that we have as a country to a global threat um, and it has shown the weaknesses in our system. system. One of the things I think has shocked us all is the inability of us as a large rich western state um, not being very good at tackling COVID and having you know, lessons from New Zealand, from Vietnam, from Hong Kong, other countries um, that, that don't have our health service, that don't have our wealth, um, being much, much better at dealing with it. Uh, the difficulty, coming back to politicians, of trying to fight an enemy that you can't see, the fact that inequalities are worse, and this health versus the economy trade-off that we're seeing played out in the, the rows over Tier 2, Tier 3, Greater Manchester um, restrictions. There are some consolations in all of this. We do have a law that says we will get to net zero emissions by 2050. We do have councils across the country that have legislated and passed motions saying that they will get to net zero in some cases even earlier. So um, as a democracy, we as citizens are able to hold those politicians' feet to the fire. I can say that with a, a degree of relish now I'm no longer a politician. Um, we know that we are going to have COP 26 uh, next year and I'm sure Claire will talk about that but we also have an interesting alignment of the stars in that uh, the UK is also hosting the G7 summit and the G20 summit is being um, hosted by uh, Italy so we are the co-hosts of COP26 so there's a very interesting I think pivot point um, in the political landscape next year. 
will politicians listen to scientists and will they listen to their citizens? It's clear that the citizens are listening to the scientists. It's less clear about the politicians. And the bit about climate resilience being the safest route out of the COVID recovery. So the Climate Assembly being very clear that they wanted green measures to lift us out of the COVID um, uh, shock. We do also, uh, another comfort is that we have the Committee on Climate Change, which reports on our carbon budget, which talks about the steps we need to take. And another piece of good news for us, um, ex-politicians and citizens, is yes, the climate resilience, climate adaptation does cost money, um, but it costs between 1% to 2% of GDP, which is the exact same sum it was predicted to cost when the Committee on Climate Change was set up back in 2008. So 1% to 2% of GDP, um, if you compare that to the the costs of, of COVID and what we've had to spend on COVID, um, we've learned, I think, a very valuable lesson that it's better to prepare in advance rather than to um, sweep up the mess afterwards. And Mark Carney, I think, very early on in the pandemic said, um, you know, one if we'd prepared for this, one day's preparation is that it, it, we've paid is one day's worth of GDP, and we've had a year's worth of GDP in costs of tackling. COVID. So it's better to spend one day's money preparing than a year's money dealing with the consequences. Now, one of the things I was always very passionate about on the EAC was to talk about concrete things. So when we did single use plastics, we talked about coffee cups and, um, and plastic bottles rather than single use plastics, because no one's really sure what a single use plastic is. And of course, now we have the, the dreaded uh, single use plastic, which is everywhere, the uh, disposable mask. Um, talk about um, jobs. And we've already created it's probably half a million jobs now in the green economy, we could grow that by 10% a year up to 2030. This is really important given the economic crisis we're facing. We know, um, going back to some of the fashion work we did, we have we create more textile waste than any other country in the EU, a million tonnes of it a year. We are going to face challenges with that with Brexit, with the largest markets, Ghana, Nigeria and Pakistan, currently closed to UK textile waste. We're getting a huge huge uh, waste mountain that is building up. What can we do with that? Can we turn that into insulation to keep up more homes warm? Can we turn that into um, an energy efficient um, industry? There are small businesses that are trying to do this. How do we align those small businesses and their need for finance with some of the big green climate money that is coming out of the United Nations? Um, what do we do about airline workers? Where is their just transition? We've seen the, air, the skies uh, free of airline pollution, but it's not enough to make a big dip in our carbon emissions. So e even if everybody stops flying tomorrow, it's still not enough um, to be the change we need to see uh, on climate. Um, just move to my next slide. Talk about flooding. Um, people in Wakefield very concerned about flooding. We had a thousand homes flooded in 2007, and it's still a very big part of people's lives in flood risk areas. We know that uh, the money to the Environment Agency has been cut. We know that there's an issue about responsibility. This is a lovely lady who was flooded out of her home um, in the 2013 floods in uh, Tewkesbury there, um, having, a, having a little moment with um, one of the emergency care workers. Um, are, is our infrastructure resilient? Um, are our electricity pylons, are our reservoirs um, sturdy enough to withstand the very deep rainfalls, the huge amount of rain that we're seeing dumped in our landscape, as we've just seen one of the wettest um, October day since record records began. Um, so how is that aligning with the government's planning white paper? So talk about flooding. These are all the adaptation pieces that we may, need to make. And so making climate change real to people is, isn't uh, isn't as Rebecca said um, she talked about the MP talking about polar bears um, th that all seems a very long way away people are concerned about the polar bears but they're also concerned about their their downstairs um, dining rooms flooding talk about the weather um, 
15 of our 16 hottest years have been since 2001. We have no building regulations to stop homes and buildings overheating. We know that the excess deaths from heat will more than triple to 7,000 a year by 2050. And um, we have buildings in the city that um, in September 2013 reflected the sun's rays so vigorously that a car actually melted in East Cheap, which is round the corner from where I'm talking to you. How can we've got to a position where our brilliant engineers and architects are putting up buildings that make our problems worse rather than making them better. So I think there's challenges there um, for builders, architects and environmental engineers and for all of us as we look at um, creating more climate resilient homes and Rebecca's point about the what happens to the gas fitters if um, if gas central heating is banned. Um, finally pollution. Um, we know that um, air, air, air pollution uh, kills around well depending on which figures you believe uh, between 29 and 40,000 excess deaths a year um, which you know is something akin to a COVID pandemic every single year in our cities and towns. Um, we know that it affects our most vulnerable citizens the worst, the uh, older people, the, um, the frail elderly and younger people with um, at risk of asthma. So you know, what are we doing? When we talk about climate change, we have to also offer a better future. We have to offer, um, you know, a way of tackling inequalities. We have to talk about creating streets that are fit for people. Um, we have to talk about making sure that with the great rush towards electric vehicles and the government's about to spend tens of millions of pounds on them, that they don't en end up encroaching on the pedestrian space, which is already being taken up, um, you know, is already unfair fit for purpose could because of the social distancing norms um my little bugbear at the moment pavement parking um how are you meant to get past um and how do we go back um to the situation when I was growing up, which is 75% of kids walking and cycling to school. At the moment, that figure is down below 50%. The government has a target of getting it to 55%. Um, there's a kind of bizarre attitude which is the streets aren't safe for my child I'll put my child in the car they will be exposed to 15 times the level of air pollution there um, and I, I will expose uh, other I, I will be sitting in traffic even though I am traffic by sitting in my car so it's a it's a way I think there's some exciting um, things happening with the emergency active travel fund I think a lot of the um, controversy about them um, is being whipped up um, by a couple of newspapers in particular. We've seen articles in the Mail and the Telegraph on this and qu there's quite a lot of um, accounts that um, are often sort of climate denying accounts etc. So um, you know as someone said wouldn't it you know what's to fear if we clean up our air get more people walking and cycling and actually um, tackle the twin epidemics that we have of um, of um, obesity and loneliness, which are the two biggest, um, you know, killers in our country. Um, so I, I think we can be optimistic as we look ahead to um, COP26. And rather than um, talking about saving the po polar bears, we should be talking about saving our fellow um, human beings. Uh, this is a lady and her grandson in Tuvalu and talk about how we are going to stop those small island states from going underwater. Thank you. Thanks very much indeed. Thanks, Mary. And uh, definitely a uh, compelling way to frame the issues to talk about it much more in terms of people's lives than, than probably polar bears. But um, I also wondered, I mean, you've been at the front line of the bruising Brexit battles, sort of sticking your constituency in the last uh, election. But, you know, some of the work we've been doing at TBI, just uh, looking at uh, British election study and other things, shows that there's quite a strong correlation between, you know, uh, uh, views on the need for climate action, or at least the urgency of it, and, and views on Brexit. And there does seem to be a sort of you know, more socially conservative voters, voters tend to be a little bit less convinced of the need to move quickly than uh, than, than sort of uh, more socially liberal voters. And also kind of better off voters seem to have moved much faster in terms of their opinions over the last five years than less well voters. And sort of in that context, the sort of dual context of 
a recession that's going to hit less well off people harder. And also, um, you know, these kind of political realignment we saw in the wake of the sort of Brexit election. Yeah. I mean, do, 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 how do you, if you were on the front line again in the politics in Wakefield, arguing about these things, I mean, do you worry that this is at risk of rather like Brexit coming seen to be an agenda for sort of better off southerners uh, or and, and what do we do about that well i think if you look at what cop 26 is going to be talking about next year it's going to talk about transport and it's going to talk about farming and food and if we go back to the climate assembly there was some pretty radical um you know banning suvs was one of their recommendations as was a 20 percent, 20 to 40 percent reduction in meat and dairy consumption and i think those two things are already happening kind of by stealth through the food programs that people are watching, through the Hairy Bikers vegetarian um, cookbook. You know, these things are happening culturally out there. Mm. And we're seeing those changes as people go to their doctors and are told what well, you need to lose weight or you need to, you know, and, and you see in the parks people that are not normally walking and cycling, getting out and trying a bit of uh, active travel, partly because of, you know, fears around public transport which are probably misplaced um but i think i think behavior change is happening and i think actually covid is a big behavior change uh issue the risk with covid is that we all go back into our cars because that's some of the messaging but if you look at um the effective nationalization of the rail and bus networks which is essentially what's happened there is a big moment for government to reset the button on public transports with the mayor there's a big moment for um government to reset agriculture through the agriculture and environment bill and reset british farming and i think you know the supermarkets who are huge influencers in in what we eat and what we buy have an opportunity as well as part of that cop process to do some of that behavior change and I think that's already happening. So, you know, I, I, I think people, as Rebecca said, people can be surprising if you trust them and ask them and if you give them the facts. And I think what came out of the, the Climate Assembly was nobody's telling us about this. It's almost yeah. like don't infantilise us. Don't tell us it's going to be easy. And what we've seen in COVID is tell us the truth. Give us the science. We'll do our bit. And I think that very cohesive sense of the nation coming together um, is something that we need to get back. I think that that has fractured now. Um, but we're seeing the young protecting the old. Climate is about um, the old protecting the young. And I think, you know, the, there's, a, there's a scope for a campaign there for, for a youth campaign to say, I wore my mask and, and, and lost my job to protect you, Granny. I'd like you to, to cut down the five meat meals and, and the use of your car to protect me. And I think those conversations, intergenerational conversations, can be powerful and are happening. Yeah, really interesting. Thank you. Okay, Claire, let's go to you for the last... Uh... So first of all, it's lovely yeah. to be... Um, of those who think that uh, politics is all about conflict, I just want to reassure you that uh, Mary and I worked, I think, really well together when I was the minister and she chaired a really powerful audit committee at, at the Environmental Audit Committee. And it, it was extraordinary. We, we actually had, uh, with the odd, odd one or two kind of SNP outlier comments, an extraordinary political consensus, I think, that developed um, of course, I like to put it all down to my political <laughs> interventions, but but we were able to pass the, the, the world's first industrialised economy, net zero legislation. We were able to bring in things like the energy price cap bill with extraordinary political consensus, actually. And it was it was a sort of golden time that enabled us to do a lot. And I, if you'll forgive me, and I've tried to do a little matrix, which is always easier to show rather than talk, but I haven't done a slide because I've been thinking about this question about has the consensus fractured? along two dimensions. One is within the UK and internationally, and then at the public sector, the government level and privately. And, you know, I have to say that on the international stage, um, it is really noteworthy the number of countries who are coming forward now with net zero targets uh, ahead of COP26. The plan, the action plan I wrote for COP was to have a 100% upgrade of these nationally determined contributions and for them all to be net zero. It's worth remembering net zero was a highly controversial 
uh, landing zone only a couple of years ago because it required effectively using some form of abstraction of carbon. So it couldn't be all about mitigation. We knew we were going to have residual carbon left in the system uh, in any scenario. And we were going to have to work out ways to abstract that. And of course, what has become really interesting is the opportunity uh, to sequester carbon, particularly in nature, but do really nature positive things. So to sequester carbon through better soil farming, through avoided deforestation, through afforestation that not only is great for climate, but is great for biodiversity if done properly and great for rural employment. There's a whole underpinning of sort of a just rural transition there. So that has become very exciting. And I think it's enabled um, countries such as Japan, who is about to announce a net zero target, really significant given their use of coal. China set net zero by 2060, the EU by 2050. So there's been a real sort of move forward. But Promises are really easy for politicians to make, right? I mean, we all know that. And none of, you know, the average duration of a prime minister under democracy is four years. And without a really strong um, governance structure like we have in the UK through the Committee on Climate Change and through carbon budgets, it's very easy to promise these things and not deliver. And that's where the actions of the local government, and I'm looking very closely now at Westminster, come to play. Because effectively, the Johnson administration was given a net zero landing zone. It was given um, a costing of that. It was given carbon budgets and a framework to, to push forward on a number of big ideas. And some of that stuff is coming through. So that, as Mary said, one of the big levers for governments is agricultural subsidies. And I genuinely think that regardless of our views on Brexit, we will see a post-Brexit ag subsidy regime that does pay for nature as a public good. And that has to be a good thing. By contrast, the EU is doing quite the opposite, which is rather depressing given their targets. But And then we've seen noises about the hydrogen economy. We've seen a focus on EV rollout. But it all feels like people are sitting around, you know, all stitching a patch to go on a patchwork quilt, but not actually thinking about who's going to cut out the quilt and put it all together. Because the thing that national governments really need to deliver if they're serious about net zero is big, tough decisions about the hard stuff. Not about, you know, um, I mean, Mary's right, we do need to change our diet and it's brilliant that that's happening. But actually what we need to do is start investing massively in infrastructure so we can bring on renewable energy from offshore wind in a way that is far more cost effective. Mary rightly pointed out our, our woeful underinvestment in the infrastructure of, of, flood, of flood resilience and also the opportunity from that. Uh, we, need, we talk about um, hydrogen, hydrogen, hydrogen eating or electrifying heat with no conversations about who is actually going to go in and effectively replace your gas boiler or my oil boiler and what we're going to do about appliances. And that's the really tough stuff. And, and the real focus of the government should not be on um, persuading us all to eat a bit less meat or to walk a bit more, much as I am a massive supporter of Mary's campaign. It should be about the hard to abate last 20%. What's the plan for steel? What's the plan for aluminium? How are we actually going to fully electrify transport and trains? I was the rail minister. We bought a ton of diesel trains. Why? Or hybrid trains. Why? Because they were cheaper to install because the cost of electrification, particularly under a rather inefficient network rail, were off the charts. So for me, the real challenge is, does government have the guts to get up every day and take the big, tough, long-term decisions? And I'm afraid my answer is, is no. And I think COVID has only... I think it was no pre-COVID, much as we tried, um, and we can talk a bit about why that is. But COVID has sapped every ounce of energy, uh, innovation, uh, focus. I mean, this is an exhausting and terrible thing. And what COVID is also sapping now is any form of democratic consensus across the country. You know, this needs to be done in coalition with democratically elected politicians at town hall or regional or even national level. Uh, and I'm afraid this is not a government that enjoys the challenge of working well uh, with, with devolved democracy. And without that, you can't deliver. So we've got good international stuff coming through. I have no doubt that COP will be a, a, a roaring headline success because I think Biden will win and will bring the US back and we'll all say hooray. But for me, the devil is, and then what? And how do we actually deliver? And remember, no pledge made at COP is binding. It's a pledge to bring forward your homework every five years and have it marked internationally, only there's no real consensus about the marking scheme. Let me turn to just briefly to what's going on though at the, the private sector level. 
some brilliant points made by both Rebecca, who I commend. I think the, the Citizens' Assembly work was absolutely fantastic. For those that trust in the wisdom of crowds, it was brilliant to see the sensibleness. And it showed a couple of things. One is that people do listen to scientists when it is explained to them in a way that makes sense. As Mary said, you can't talk about single-use plastics. What is that? You talk about things that they understand. Secondly, um, we have appeared to accept vast amounts of government intervention in our lives through COVID that would have been unthinkable even a year ago. So to the extent we need to do things differently to deal with the climate crisis, if we feel there is a threat to our hearth and home, we're prepared to do it. And lastly, and this relates to my wonderful kind of world ownership background <laughs> behind me, um, I've joined an organisation which was set up at the very first Rio Earth Summit, the World Business Council for Sustainable Development, that is the place for the world's most ambitious private sector companies to bring their sustainability ambitions. And the good news is companies that have survived the cash flow crisis, which has hit sectors very hard, are really doubling down on their climate and more broadly sustainability ambition. You know, you've seen BP doing extraordinary things with its portfolio analysis. You've seen Unilever pledging net zero all the way along its supply chain from cradle to shelf. Um, th these are extraordinary things. Why? Because COVID's allowed them to, because it's, you know, there's, there's so much disruption, if you like, in the markets. And secondly, because they've seen the impact of a massive hit to their business resilience if we don't plan and prepare for this. And lastly, the thing that I think we need to do uh, in order to act. So, so I think for me, it's a sort of question mark as to how the private sector is accepting this. But for me, the thing we have to do is we have to make this understandable and easy for people. What is net zero? Nobody has a clue. What does this actually mean when we talk about, you know, you know, offsets? It's nonsense. We, we've, we've talked in, a, I think, a, sort of a, a Masonic code about climate for so long, rather than trying to make it understandable. And to your earlier question, Ian, I think you know, I did a lot of work, as, as Mary knows, in Grimsby, uh, which has benefited enormously from uh, the offshore wind investment. It, it wasn't obvious that people understood net zero, but they jolly well understood the impact of Orsted locating its very highly skilled control centre on Grimsby docks, uh, where I think Melanie Ord's dad, who I always worked well with, also worked. They understood that opportunity from that transition and they were delighted that these benighted towns who had been left behind, frankly, by so many governments had a real growth driver. So if you can talk about the opportunity, you can talk about that intergenerational fairness and you can talk about trusting the science um, in a way that we've, we've started to do with COVID. I think we then have to start to have a package of citizens, ordinary people really committing to this and wanting to be part of it. But let me ask, finish with the final thing. We then have to elect governments not based on getting Brexit done, but on what you're actually going to do to make sure this place is a livable place in 30 years' time. I mean, this is there is a, a cheapening of political debate and, and, frankly, campaigning, which we all felt. Uh, and it was striking that the Green Party, and, you know, I think it, in overall, I'm not a, a fan of the Green Party policies, but they certainly campaign. They've done particularly poorly in the UK elections, both at a national and a local level. So somehow we've got to take our belief about this intergenerational fairness and the importance of climate to the ballot box, both in Westminster and locally, and start making those expressions of preference known. Brilliant. Thank you, Claire. And Claire, just in terms of the COP26 run up, I mean, you know, you, you talk about the the Masonic language of climate change policy and all this kind of stuff. And I just wonder if you, if you were the president of COP26 still, would you, what has the COVID crisis, what, what would that make you change about the emphasis and direction of that event? So, so it does speak to people. So, so even pre-COVID, I mean, look, I, one of the reasons that Boris fired me from the job was A, that I was no longer a politician because I'd stepped down from front bench politics and so I wasn't very useful to him and B, because I was determined that COP26 had to be an inflection point. COPs have been going for 25, 25 years. Since then, emissions have gone up by over 50%. They are an exercise in, uh, in zero-sum talking. So negotiators sit in a room and argue, they even argue about the agenda. That requires two days of, of arguing and voting. It is the most disconnected thing I have ever seen. In fact, I sat in COP25 in Madrid while we had half a million protesters on the, on, the, on the streets. And I sat in a plenary session where we argued whether the definition of the meeting we were in was an informal or an informal informal. It was disgraceful. <laughs> And I was determined that COP26 became focused on 
on not just pledges, but action and actually bringing what is rather sweetly called the real economy, which is apparently something different from the economy we talk about in COP, i.e. where stuff happens. That doesn't have a natural docking point in COP. So we have action champions, we have work going on, we've got Mark Carney, who I recruited, who's been amazing on the finance agenda. But that doesn't sit naturally. The heart of COP is 200 people locked in a room arguing. And let me give you another example as I'm on it. We have a conversation every year about finance. It is absolutely right that finance flows to countries, both for adaptation and mitigation. Every year in that debate, Saudi Arabia stands up and says, we need more money from you lot because you're damaging our economy. And instead of everyone falling about laughing, we all kind of debate that point seriously. It's a disgrace. And that is what needs to change. And I fear, honestly speaking, that it is not changing because actually because it's so complicated, because it's Masonic, it defaults to that stuff. So I hope and pray, and I've left behind a really good action plan and a good COP team that we deliver action, but we'll judge it as success, not just on the pledges that are brought to COP, but what's the baseline GHG emissions and how much do we expect it to drop next year and who's going to track and report that back. We have to make COP real and relevant, not just a talking shop. Okay, great. Right, let's move to some questions from the audience. Um, uh, Anna Turley has a question. Anna, I'll uh, unmute you to ask your question about skills. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for having me. Um, yeah, really fascinating presentations. Thank you all very much. Um, I was wanting to ask about skills because obviously in an area where, um, you know, we've suffered a lot of sort of deindustrialization, there's a lot of opportunities here around issues like hydrogen, which I know Claire and I worked on um, closely when we were both in Parliament, um, and sort of new green industries and so on. But the big challenge is going to be making that skills transition. Um, so I just wondered if the panel had any thoughts and views on the role and how we go about making sure that we equipped areas, particularly those like Redco and areas that have quite a skills deficit really and quite a, a low sort of educational outcomes to prepare areas like this for a sort of transition to a green economy. Great thanks and then let's go to Christina. Christina powell has got a question about planning and all things related to housing. Um, well I guess I was thinking about sort of the impact of housing and the challenge that housing poses regarding bringing the UK to net zero. At the moment because of planning deregulation about a third of the private rented sector fails the UK government decency standards. And there was a white paper by the government in August hinting to further deregulation. So I was wondering, you know, in this context, how would you implement on time the massive changes the housing stock will need to become net zero? And does the current government with its incoherences and sort of lack of local consensus that some of you hinted to um, have the credibility to deliver this? And if not, I mean, what, what then? Okay, great, thank you. And then I'll go to Henry Adams, who's got a question uh, about what's going on in Cumbria. Well, Becky has already brought up this, this question. Uh, I'll repeat it. Here in Cumbria, the political pressure on local politicians, MPs and councillors to provide jobs in the Whitehaven area, together with a failure by government to update its policies, planning guidance and legislation, to comply with meeting the Paris Agreement temperature goals has resulted in Cumbria County Council as voting on 2nd of October to approve the coal mine as Becky uh, has just brought up, even though it's not needed by the steel industry really uh, and was result in those huge uh, emissions of over 9 million tonnes. Um, this is clearly of national an international importance and uh, I'm keen to hear what the panel would respond in relation to uh, the fact that this has happened really because of a failure to update the, 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 the underlying po government policy uh, um, uh, and legislation to be compatible with the Paris Agreement uh, and, and that really needs to be done urgently before COP26. What are the panel's comments on that underlying right. problem? Thanks, Henry. Okay, so we've got questions on skills, planning and housing stock and the Cumbria. My Claire, do you want to go first on that? You're on mute. 
Anna, lovely to hear your voice. Hope you're doing really well. And, and you were a brilliant uh, advocate for that, that skills transition, you know, and uh, anyway, but I was going to say something political, but I won't. But anyway, um, so I think the, the answer, Anna, which we did talk about a lot, is that sense of the public-private partnership. So, you know, as we did with Offshore Wind, where we basically said, what will you, the industry, do to raise your productivity, raise your low onshore employment, onshore your supply chain and in fact raise diversity what will you do and in return we will invest alongside you and that has been a missing conversation and I know that there have been various attempts through the regional and metro mayor concept which I know you worked extremely closely with uh, so there, there are good plans in place but it, it's I just don't think any one actor can deliver that it needs to be a really carefully thought through in basically a local industrial strategy and also some sense of hope for people. Because I remember when I was um, energy minister, you know, the oil and gas workers, they could understand that we might have a great opportunity for those skills working in tough environments offshore. But nobody had ever sat down with them from the renewables industry and talked about that transition. So I'm not a fan of government websites that tell you to go and retrain for certain things. I think it needs to be a far more locally local exercise but I do think if that's well executed that can provide some 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 real jobs and skills training and transition Christina and Henry both raised a point I think around around local planning and here I'm going to slightly sound uh, like a Tory which is the challenge is whenever we try and pull levers in Westminster on anything to do with planning it runs afoul of decades of tangled planning policy and also frankly unempowered local councils I strongly believe Town halls have a ton of levers when it comes to more sustainable housing development than they use. It is entirely in the purview of Wiltshire Council, where I live, to specify renewable energy, tree cover. It's been done in High Wycombe, better water usage. And they don't do it. Why? Because they're petrified that somehow the, the inspectors are going to come after them. I would like local councils to have a much more muscular approach, take it and see if it gets challenged, particularly when they're trying to deliver all this new housing that we know we need. Because I actually think having sat in Westminster furiously trying to pull levers for many years over planning issues, over housing issues, it doesn't work unless you've got the local councils on the ground who have the final arbiter of planning going forward. And Henry, to your coal mine? I mean, like, I don't know, I can't remember whether it can be called in. It's a disgrace. And I, and I don't say that lightly because I understand the need for jobs. But if we are serious about making coal history, which is the number one thing the world needs to do to accelerate this net zero transition, we should not be mining coal anywhere. The challenge, of course, is that's coal for coking not heating or not for energy and we don't have a good solution for coking coal in those high heat industries that's where the hydrogen debate comes in but we won't help that transition by continuing to provide um cheap coking coals so i just think we you know we'll be coal free in the uk energy system uh, by 2025 by law we need to take coal out of our system completely Okay, great. Mary, I'll come to you. If we could keep answers as short as possible, I might be able to get one more round. Okay, so totally agree with... Um, hi, Anna, I miss you and it's lovely to, to hear your voice and um, I, I wish we were still sitting next to each other on the green benches. Um, but um, on the coking side, we need to go back and talk to the steel industry about what they need to make that transition. And that's where Claire's piece about where where's the hard stuff that government needs to be acting um, and, and setting policy. That's not being done. And that's where government needs to come in because it does require a large amount of investment to, to make huge old um, legacy um, infrastructure convert to solar if we're going to keep that industry in our country. Um, on the planning piece, Christina... Um, um, I think um, we have a planning system that creates suburban sprawl. We have out of town shopping developments that kill the city centres and in induce traffic. We have um, estates that are built that don't have pavements on them. So we are literally building in car dependency into our homes. And I think we we plan at the wrong level. The, the, the local council level is too small. We should have a regional spatial sprawl. Uh, planning strategy and we should talk about which areas are going to be woodland which areas are going to be farmland which areas are going to be housing and we should build the public transport before we build the homes and that's what they do in France and every mile of tram that they build um, going out of Bordeaux city centre 
the, 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 the development happens, you build the transport first and you build the housing afterwards. And we always build the housing first and then say, oh, would you fancy a free bus pass to get on the bus? Oh, by the way, there is no bus, but but it'll be a free bus pass. So we've ticked our, our little box. I think the planning white paper is going to be killed um, by a, a conservative backbench rebellion. Um, and, and obviously, I think Labour are opposing it because of um, the deregulatory side, the removal of that democratic oversight. But we need to look at other countries where they spatially plan better um, and where they build transport before they build houses. And I think we, we're, we're obsessed with houses in this country and it's all about where we put our wealth. So I think we need to turn that debate on its head. Anna, your point about skills. COVID has shown that we can learn remotely from home. So you, the fact that you live in red car and you can't get to your university or your FE college to retrain is no longer a reason not to be able to retrain or not to get the skills you need. But we know that FE has had a massive hit, lost a third of its money over 10 years. So what do the FE colleges do to attract those missing adult learners? Because um, we know from the Education Select Committee that they have disappeared. Those people who in their 30s and 40s would have retrained 10 or 15 years ago are not now retraining because of, the, of that uh, FE college gap. Um, and finally, on hydrogen, I think hydrogen has a place in large scale heating and potentially for bus fleets, but I don't think it's the answer to individual um, transport. And I'm even sceptical about bus fleets. So I think it has a place uh, and it's a way of recycling, if you like, some of the legacy um, uh, chemicals and um, infrastructure that we have in places like Teesside. But I don't think it's a golden a bullet solution for the rest of the country. OK, great. Uh, Rebecca, do you want to come in on any of those? Yeah, I mean, I think what's striking to me is that all those, you know, to a certain extent, the solutions in all those areas, housing, planning, skills, coal mines, uh, lies in actually having a comprehensive and forward looking strategy for climate. I'm a huge fan of the Climate Change Act, but it's, it's, it's necessary, but not sufficient. It basically is about budgets and targets. And there's nothing in there beyond Bayes about really what, what, what uh, responsibility individual departments should take or uh, local authorities. So, you know, we're, we're crying out for a plan that, that, that provides that. And interestingly, that is something the Climate Assembly said very strongly. It's also something the same week that the Institute for Government, who, you know, again, love them dearly, they're uber geeks, right? So we have the citizens and the uber geeks saying exactly the same about what's needed. And why would that help? Well, you know, it would help with housing and planning because it would provide that national local link. It would help with skills because it's not just about skills possibly uh, policy. It's about providing industries with that or people with that certainty that if they retrain, there will be a job for them. What we mm. saw over the feed-in tariff, for example, was, you know, plumbers, electricians retraining to fit solar panels and then the bottom falling out of the market when the, when the, when the feed-in tariff collapsed. So you need that certainty for skills. And then, I mean, Henry, you and I both know very well that the coal mine situation has come about because of those ambig ambiguities in climate policy, which allow local politicians and local planning officers to attempt a tortuous argument to suggest that the coal mine might be in line with the Climate Change Act and the Paris Agreement because, you know, the coal would be imported from elsewhere if it wasn't. I mean, it's, it's nonsense, but there is enough wriggle room in there that they can do that. And so we don't have that, that consistency and certainty, and that's at the root of all those problems I think. Okay fantastic let's take a couple of quick questions then I'll ask everybody just to wrap up as well. I'll first go to Gaurav Chowdhury who wants to um, uh, uh, explore this kind of trade-off in short term and long term. Gaurav can you hear us do you want to say your question? Yeah sure can can you hear yeah yeah so, thanks for the opportunity to ask uh, it's really related to the the basic trade-off and the, the premise of the entire talk uh, a couple panelists made an assertion that citizens are listening to scientists. Um, and I, I think, it, you know, from a communications angle that's that's happening, uh, that trend is, is picking up. But when it comes to direct trade-offs to voters, you think about the fuel duties, for example, um, in terms of that long-term benefit versus short-term costs, who, what, what tensions end up prevailing? Interested in, in hearing more about that. Okay, and I'll take one more from Pablo Martin, who's got a question on, uh, relates to Brexit. Uh, Pablo, can you hear us? Uh, hello, can you hear me? Great, yeah, far away. I wanted to ask, uh, what effect ca effects can Brexit have on uh, the UK's net zero plan? 
And how could that set back the UK as compared to other EU countries or members? Fantastic, thank you. Okay, so uh, the, the, the economic tension and the Brexit challenge, uh, let's go to the panel with those and any final comments. Uh, Rebecca, if I may, I'll start with you. Sure, okay. So in answer to Gaurav's question, I don't think that's a choice that we should be offering people. It shouldn't be, you know, basically what is in people's short-term interests should be aligning with our long-term climate goals and actually our long-term social and economic goals. We, you know, it, it, it's completely wrong to offer people um, choices which which don't align with those long-term prospects. Again, you know, that's something the Climate Assembly understood. And if you get it wrong, you do get that political backlash. And that's we, what we saw in, 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 in France with the Gilets Jaunes, for example. And I'm really worried about that especially in the current political uh, situation. So I would say they shouldn't, they should, citizens shouldn't be making, shouldn't be forced to make those choices. I mean, Pablo on Brexit, I'd, I mean, you know, I'm, there's a lot of ways in which the technical policy, uh, it makes it much harder post Brexit. Um, but I also think that the sort of political um you know, the, 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 the political atmosphere has made it a lot harder, essentially, for multilateralism. And, you know, what can we do about that? It's where we are, but it, it, it makes our job harder for sure. OK, uh, 30 seconds, Mary, and then Claire. Oh, you're on, still on. Uh... Claire first, because she's got to jump okay. off. Thank you so much. I'm so I'm going to have to jump off without listening to Mary. But uh, so two things. Actually, on Brexit, because our domestic uh, targets have always been much more ambitious than the EU's, both at a national level, but also for, for specific sectors, we'll be fine in terms of our own net zero target. What we are losing is the ability to do joined up diplomacy. And the reason China and co have come forward with net zero targets is actually primarily due to Macron and the EU. And for me, it's a huge shame that we're not being muscular in those vastly important international debates. Gaurav, you're right on the trade-off point. I think for me, it's not necessarily about phrasing it as either or. So, you know, we don't think enough about giving people small incentives to do the right thing. What about if we gave people not just, not just buyers um, incentives for electric vehicles, which are swallowed up in the leasing costs because 85% of people buy their cars on a lease. So the cash balance basically goes to the dealer. What about if we just gave people a £500 voucher? for buying an electric vehicle direct to them. I think one of the, we haven't even touched on the psychology of this, but one of the things we never do is explore nudges mm -hmm. to help people make actually really impactful decisions with quite small things. And I think that's where we have to go. So these trade-offs are not terrible. They're actually, well, why wouldn't you just do that? So I'm so sorry. I've loved talking to everybody. I'm going to have to jump because I've got a back-to-back, -back, this horrible Zoom agenda, but it's been such a pleasure to join you all and to see some old friends. Take care. Thanks, Claire. Bye -bye. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Claire. And so I've got 30 seconds. Mary, finally um, for you. Yeah, I, I want to come in on the, 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 the point Claire made about psychology. We should be sustainable by default. So in a way, that's what we've done with electricity. We didn't ask people if they wanted renewable energy. They just turned on their light and the light came on and it just happened that behind the scenes, we changed it so it was solar and, and wind. Um, we need to be doing that in the food area. So, you know, meat-free Mondays, whatever it is, Wednesdays. I, I've been, you know, fish on Fridays. In a way, COVID was the only, there was, every day was the same. I, I want, at one point, my son said, what month are we in? And so for me, having distinctions between the meals was the only way I knew which day of the week I was on and 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 it's, it's small things like that where you're kind of you you can say to people you know that people say I'm not a climate warrior and they say oh but you do like gardening you do have an allotment have you noticed how things have changed have you noticed that there's apple blossom on your apple tree in October I don't know how I managed to do that this year but you know talking to people so that they care about the climate in their own way and it's about the psychology of behaviour change is about making people feel that when we talk about these things, we are talking to them from wherever they are at. So there's the sustainability by default piece, but there's also meeting people where they care, whether that's because they've got an asthmatic child, whether it's because they've got COPD and a lot of people in those red wall seats suffer, are suffering the long term effects, either um, of um, 
uh, industrial um, exposure or of, of smoking. And so there's a lot, there's a high burden of um, lung disease or because they, you know, there's a tradition in, in mining communities of, of having your greenhouse out the back and, and doing that when you came off shift. You know, it's those, those are the ways into those communities. And I think just finding ways of speaking to that that isn't just a David Attenborough documentary mm -hmm. is, is going to be really important as we go forward. Fantastic. Thank you, uh, Mary. Um, I, there's obviously going to be huge challenges ahead with Brexit, with c the COVID recovery and all, all sorts of things. They're all going to put pressure on the politics around net zero. But I'm certainly more confident after this morning's discussion that there's ways of avoiding uh, that becoming a false trade off. So thank you uh, to Rebecca, to Mary and to Claire for some fantastic contributions and all of you for uh, attending. Look out for further work we'll be doing on the politics of net zero in the coming months and uh, further discussions in the run up to COP26. Uh, all that remains for me to do is to say thank you for joining. I'm sorry we were run over. I hope you have a good rest of Thursday. Bye-bye.